Acts chapter 9. Perhaps because of the type of ministry, the teaching ministry that the way represents, we do not spend the amount of time dealing with the healing ministry and its different facets as frequently as you might find among other groups. Because of our teaching ministry, we believe that people have to learn to understand the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And in order to understand this, there are many different segments, many different facets of knowledge from the Bible which have to be taught, learned, and understood. Among these, of course, is this ministry of healing. Now, first of all, before we get into this chapter, let me just say to you that there is a tremendous difference between praying for the sick and ministering to them. You can pray for the sick anytime, anywhere, under any situation. But when you begin to minister to the sick, it takes on an entirely different biblical aspect. For in the ministry of healing, in the ministry of healing, you have to operate the manifestations of the Spirit. And in the category of the manifestations of the Spirit, there are only nine manifestations. Speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of what? Spirits, faith, miracles, and healing. All nine of these manifestations must be in operation in every believer if he is going to minister healing according to the revelation of God's Word. Now, before we get into the healing teaching of this particular night, I would like to read the opening part of this particular chapter 9 because we're going to hear, read about a man whose name was Saul. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. This man was a real persecutor of the Christians. He hated the Christians, spiritually speaking. He disliked them. He thought they were absolutely wrong about everything they believed. And yet, God saved him. I believe that since knowledge-wise, no one would ever have dreamed that the apostle Paul, who who he was to become, that Saul would ever become the apostle Paul. I doubt very much if any of us would have given him a front seat in our church. We perhaps would have said he's hopeless. God can't help him. But this is one reason I want to read the record, because God did help him, and there is no man living, there is no woman living whom God cannot help, whose need cannot be met by God Almighty. And when he meets that need, he can take the life of a man or a woman and turn it upside down, which is right side up, and make them effervesce and glow with the power of God. Such a man was Saul. A man who was worthless in one sense, but when he got saved, born again of God's Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, he became the greatest mouthpiece for God that the world has ever had. Chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Before we read the third verse, let me just say that the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ were called followers of the way. Before they were called Christians. They were called Christians in Antioch of Syria first. But long before they were called Christians, they were called followers of the way. And this is why he desired uh, letters in Damascus of the high priest that if any were found who were followers of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them unto Jerusalem. Verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. 
And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling, by the way, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, is an Orientalism. And in a few weeks, our wonderful friend Bishop K.C. Pillai will be here to teach Orientalism's customs and mannerisms. And he perhaps will not handle this, but he'll handle many things like this in the Bible. When they drove the oxen, when they drove the oxen, they always had a long stick. They plow with them, you know, like this. The oxen up here, and then they plow back here, and they had a long stick. They, they, they didn't have, what do you call that, you put on horses and stuff. Rain. They didn't have a rain on them so they could gee and haul them, right and left them. They didn't have those, so they simply had a goad. A goad, it's called. It's a, it's a wooden stick, and it's pointed at the end. And when old Nellie Bell the ox would move, he'd poke her one, see? And then he not only would give her a little poke, but he'd hold that stick right behind her leg. So if she'd kick back on it, she'd hurt herself very much. And this is why it's called a prick, because the more they kicked, the harder they hurt themselves, the more they injured themselves. And this is the picture that we have here regarding this particular incident. He said unto... Uh, he said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against what? The harder you kick against the things of God, the more you get hurt. Right? Why, well, sure. Because the word of God liveth and abideth forever. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. And the word of God is sharper than any two-edged one. That's what it says in Hebrew. Right? And so... When the Word of God is offered and we kick against the Word of God, we hurt ourselves. We injure ourselves. If it isn't the Word of God, it can't hurt you. But if it's the Word of God, it's the sword. It's the pointed part. I like this goad. And that's the picture. Paul had been persecuting whom? The Christians. And here he had received letters from the highest authority in Jerusalem to go to Damascus and to bring together, get together the Christians whom he could find, put them in chains, and bring them back enslaved to the city of Jerusalem. Well, verse 6, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no what? No, no man. Verse 8. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. He was blind. For they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and did neither eat nor what? Drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus, not an apostle, not a bishop, but just a certain what? <laughs> Men and women like those of us gathered here tonight, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, followers of the way, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, followers of him. We are disciples, just a certain disciple. He had no ministry in the body. To the end where he was an apostle, or a prophet, or an evangelist, or a teacher, or a pastor. He was a disciple. He was a born-again believer named, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he what? Prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. 
And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered in the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scaled, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. This is a tremendous truth in here, the whole section. First of all, just a disciple. The Lord says to him, Arise, go into the street called Straight, go to the house of Judas, and you inquire for a fellow named Saul. And when you get there, he's going to be doing one thing. He'll be praying, for he prayeth. 